All right, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on navigating your partner marketing strategy during COVID-19. Uh, we'll go for, Todd and I will go for about 30 or 40 minutes and then we'll leave some time for Q&A uh, at the end. You can use the Q&A box at the bottom and then we will try to answer uh, as many as you can. You can wait till the end or you can put them in as you go and then we'll uh, administer them at the end. So welcome again. Uh, my name is Bob Glazer. I'm the founder and CEO of Acceleration Partners, uh, one of the leading partner marketing uh, agencies. And uh, I'll introduce my co let my co-conspirator uh, introduce himself here. Thanks, Bob. I'm Todd Crawford. I am a co-founder and vice president of strategic initiatives at Impact. We are a global SaaS provider of partner marketing solutions. Uh, Bob, looks like you're working from home today. Uh, I am. This is my new new working on the mountain. Um, all right. So you're you're out in Boston, you're, 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 oh, I'm yeah. in Santa Barbara. We can we can live through virtual backgrounds. Right. Right. All right. Well, let's get going. Let's let's first take a look at some market conditions and trends that we've been seeing. Um, Bob through his clients, us through some of our data, and kind of give you guys a I guess a foundation that we can work off of through the rest of the presentation. First, let's talk about what's working, what businesses are doing well. I think it's a no brainer. Everybody probably realizes delivery services are working well because we're all working from home and none of us want to leave our house. So that's been doing really well, both um, products and uh, food delivery. Uh, some retailers are doing well, uh, some are flat and some are barely down, which I would put all in the doing well bucket uh, under these conditions. Um, We'll get into more details specific to retailers and some follow-up slides. Uh, online education has been doing well, kind of two sides to that. You've got uh, people like us sitting around the house saying, maybe I take a little bit of time for myself and learn some new things, but also uh, people are doing homeschooling and trying to find uh, resources to educate uh, their children. Online entertainment, uh, streaming uh, movies and TV, has definitely been exploding and uh, health and wellness and uh, people obviously wanting to kind of take care of themselves a little bit while they're uh, isolating. Go on to the next slide. So when we dig into some of the segments that are doing well, surprisingly or to some people maybe, shoes is doing well. I think, I think there's two, two reasons for that. I think in some cases when people get a little depressed, maybe they want to buy more shoes but also people are exercising. They want to walk, run, ride their bike, and maybe they're looking to get new shoes. So there's definitely been an uptick in shoes. Apparel has been doing well across the board. Um, I'm sure some of you have read or seen where people are kind of buying outfits from the waist up for meetings like this, where they're on Zoom all day. Um, we've also got, uh, as I talked about, personal care, um, kind of home spa, taking care of yourself, uh, supplements, uh, as well as uh, fitness equipment. People are used to being able to go to the gym and they still want to exercise. So they're, I guess, assembling some type of gym at home, whether getting a, pen, a, a bike or a, a, a yoga mat. Uh, pet supplies have been doing really well. Uh, people don't want to go out and shop for those. It's really easy to shop online and get those delivered. We talked about uh, education, but also arts and crafts, trying to keep kids occupied, probably reduce screen time give them something a little more uh, tactile to work on. And then of course, uh, your work from home supplies. Uh, most people don't have a, a good uh, setup for everything they need. So they've had to kind of fill the gap in there. And Todd, just, just one note on some of the segments, I think and we'll talk about this later, but uh, you know, some of the folks that are known for some of these things are kind of out of supply and the store is bare. And there's an opportunity for brands that carry these things that aren't as known for it to, to, to step in uh, and take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, they should definitely be looking at those categories and pushing them to the surface of their homepage um, to kind of get better known, known for carrying those products, I agree. So let's talk about the downside here. Um, who's been impacted the most? Uh, travel, uh, I saw a stat that TSA had 5% uh, of the number of travels in a given day, uh, year over year. So we're really, <laughs> Travel's really not happening, uh, along with that live events and sports aren't happening. Um, financial service is kind of a double-edged sword because we have 
high demand for credit right now because there's uncertainty uh, uh, for income for some people. Some people have been laid off, so they need a backstop. Um, people are looking to finance, refinance their homes because the interest rates being low. There's um, small business loans and things that people have to go through their banks. So there's kind of two things going on here. If you think about a financial institution that's managing risk, uh, there's risk in giving credit at any time, but probably more so now. Also, <clears throat> financial institutions are not built to have an entire work from home uh, <laughs> workforce. And so to process all of this and be being work from home outside of very gated systems um, and being able to process all of these applications is a challenge. So they're, they're getting a lot more demand and then they're weighing the risk of, of supply. So that's something that, that's probably going to see a pullback. You've got your legacy retailers. And by that, I mean the ones that have brick and mortar stores. Uh, some have had to close completely because they're not essential and others have um, reduced sales. And so that's um, putting pressure on the, the online part of the business, which may be the sole source of revenue. Um, then you have you know, non-discretionary luxury. I mean, if you think about People are living inside their homes, um, buying a, a new purse or a, a nice dress. You have nowhere <laughs> to, to use that. So uh, a lot all, of all dressed are, up and no place to go. No, <laughs> literally. All right. So I think people are, are definitely holding back there. They're really focused on what they need to get by day to day and having, you know, probably more people in your home all the time. It, it's just, that's the last thing you need to think of. And then another part of the economy that's been severely impacted is in location services. So thinking, you know, going and getting a massage, getting your hair cut, getting your nails done. Even, you know, you think about an Uber as an in-person experience and, uh, you know, getting a uh, ride share. So there's a lot of things where you would normally have to interact with another person to consume that service that is impacted as well. And when we kind of narrow down just on retail and think about what are some of their challenges, for some retailers, what they're selling is just low demand. I mean, I don't need a, a new case for my iPhone, right? It's not going to wear out sitting at home. Uh, so there's certain products and services that just people aren't thinking about or caring about. There's also inventory issues. A lot of products are made overseas and either they're not getting made or they're delayed. Uh, and so they're not able or the, they're, they're not able to ship or there's delays in shipment. So they're running out of inventory. And even if they have inventory, uh, potentially their fulfillment centers are working with reduced staff or they've had to close them or the demand for what they're selling is so high that the, the delivery dates are so pushed out that it can actually impact sales. People aren't going to buy something if it's going to take till June to get it delivered. Uh, the store closures are also a big challenge because there's a lot of costs for retailers. Um, they've got rent, they've got utilities, they've got people, and they've also got inventory in those stores. And those stores are not designed to become fulfillment centers. So they've got inventory that they can't really repurpose. Um, so that's been a big challenge for the brick and mortar. Um, but also even online stores are closing because they're just, they cannot support, um, they, there's nothing to sell or they, they don't have the, uh, the, the inventory. And then this shift to remote and limited workforce is very difficult for some organizations. You know, the bigger you are, the more, I guess, you know, old school, it's a challenge. Most of these retailers have, you know, disaster recovery plans, but they're designed around a single store event, a busted pipe uh, or a weather event something like that that affects a small portion not the entire united states not all of north america not the entire global economy so they're not sitting on a lot of cash uh, most retailers and businesses in general have one two three maybe six months of cash flow if they're lucky so let's uh look at what some of these brands are having to do about that I'll go to the they're having to lay off or furlough employees, right? I mean, they want to rehire them. They need to get, get reopened. They need to get the economy going. So, uh, but that is usually any company's biggest expense or uh, salary. They're reducing hours, which again is impacting uh, spending power. Because if you're only making a portion of your 
of your, of your salary. Um, and they're trying to manage cash flow. And by that, they have contracts um, where they're committed to paying a bill every month or uh, their rent or whatever. And what they're trying to do now to manage cash flow is push out uh, the payment term. So they might have net 30, net 45, net 60 with their vendors. They're reaching out to vendors and trying to see if they can push those out another 30, 60, 90 days. So in the hopes that the economy will rebound and they will get uh, cash coming in. So, and then they're also looking to reduce discretionary costs or costs that they're not contractually obligated. Um, and if you think of one in particular that we're all concerned about, and that would be marketing spend. If we aren't able to turn that into revenue, if our return on ad spend is not yeah. going to be there and we don't, we aren't able to fulfill or sell our products and services, then we, we're not gonna market them. So that's uh, another uh, challenge. And then how that affects the partnership channel or affiliate channel is some programs are being turned off, completely suspended. Um, they're trying to extend payment terms as well, right? I mean, if I can um, push the money I owe my partners out a little until I have that cash flow, um, some are reducing commissions. And there's kind of two reasons there. I think one is they're getting those sales because they're high demand consumables and they feel that um, there's really maybe not as inc much incrementality from those referrals. Uh, and then the other is um, they, they don't have as much to fulfill and sell and they're, they're trying to manage costs. And then something else that you're, we're seeing is when you're closing or being impacted by your offline uh, reduced revenues, it's causing executive panic because really all they have is the online revenues, which you know some companies it's 25% of all their revenues, some it's 50, but it's not all. And so if they're closing offline uh, stores, they're suddenly under pressure to supplant that revenue uh, through their online efforts, and you you know you can't always get blood from a turnip. So they're they're making decisions that I think I'll, some of them on the Monday morning kind of quarterback. Uh, is going to be are going to be seen as mistakes. It's it's normal. They're not taking two three weeks to figure out a plan, and uh, you know if you're an affiliate team, you're not probably making these decisions. Your CFO is or your executives are, and they're just telling you these are the changes to your program. Get them out, roll them out today. So it's challenging for everyone here, um, and obviously on the partner affiliate side, they're businesses and and people too, and they have expectations to get paid and, and continue their business and it's being negatively impacted as well. So there is a little bit of a silver lining here, um, you know, in kind of what comes next. And I think an increased reliance on partnership marketing is what we're going to see come out of, of this uh, now pandemic probably going into a recession. So let's just kind of take a look back at three things that have happened or two things that have happened previously that have really boded well for the industry. Uh, I've been in the industry since 98, so I was there when the dot-com uh, bubble burst. And so obviously a lot of those internet startups just imploded. Um, they were raising lots of venture capital money and they were spending it as fast as they could. A lot of the spend was what drove their value. The number of eyeballs that their advertising spend was getting and the number of visits to their site. That's how they were measured. So the more money they spent at AOL, and other portals on display buys, the more the value of their company went up. And what happened was when that collapsed, uh, this little known negligible channel called affiliate suddenly had the light shown on it and brands started shifting spend into that channel. And it really helped legitimize the channel and get it elevated into the C-suite or upper management to say, this is a channel that we can leverage. Now, fast forward seven more years, we had the recession hit. Uh, and what happened there is we had a consumer mind shift. So in 2001, we had a marketing and business approach mind shift. In 2008, we had a consumer mind shift. The consumer said, look, my, I'm losing my house. My 401k collapsed. I don't have a job. My investments are way down. I've got to spend wisely. And so they suddenly started going to coupon and loyalty sites 
to try to maximize uh, their dollars. And so what we're seeing now in 2020 with a, in the middle of a global pandemic headed into a recession is, is the combination of 2001 and 2008. You're gonna have a marketing and business mind shift that says we need to leverage performance partnerships more. And the consumer mind shift never shifted from 2008. They're continuing, that, that became habitualized. Most consumers want a deal. They want to get loyalty. They want to get coupons. And so what you're going to see now is brands are going to need to leverage that to accelerate out of this recession, to gain mind share. And if you think about the brands that feel they compete most with like the likes of Amazon, Amazon is not known really for coupons. They've got good prices. They've got a lot of other services. They've got, you know, prime delivery. And to woo customers away and habituate them to become more your customer uh, as, the, as time moves on, you're really going to have to re-embrace um, the coupon and loyalty. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, Todd and I are both pinching ourselves, you know, a little, a little bit in this because wh what I think you see in all of these things is people get back to performance and what works. And I was talking to someone yesterday. They said they turned on a lot of display. They turned off a lot of search. They kind of been shocked. At, at sort of the, the, the not as incremental as they thought. Um, a lot of large brands, the only thing that's running right now is they're a partner and affiliate program. And it's opening up discussions and channels with CEOs and CMOs reaching out to our counterparts and programs we're working on. And like, this never happens. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is what we've all been trying to do for years is to elevate, you know, the channel up. But it's interesting when you strip out all the noise, um, you know, the ROI becomes pretty important. And, and to Todd's last slide, and we'll talk about this, you, you got a lot of people making some bad decisions. They're sort of stealing from Peter to pay Paul, who's at home with his closed store when, when Peter's doing pretty well. And, and I'm not, I understand the knee-jerk reaction, but it's probably not the best long-term approach. All right, and I'll just wrap up here with this one more slide here on uh, my point is, uh, you know, why we're seeing this trend, right? The brands need to, minimize marketing spend. Uh, they need to minimize risk and they want more, they wanna maximize growth. And that's where this channel really shines, right? Because you, you know your return on ad spend, you're setting it, your commission rate is setting your return on ad spend and you're only paying for your marketing spend when you get uh, what you value most, in most cases a sale. So, you know, even if you're reducing your margin you know, you've got to look at this as long term because you want, you can't get greedy now by reducing commissions to almost nothing, uh, not using coupons and loyalty and trying to maximize your, uh, you know, net revenues out of this, your margin, uh, because you're actually probably going to make less money in the long run. And you're going to wear down kind of with what Bob's going to go into kind of the, your, your relationship with your customer and your partners. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that I've always talked about is the notion of brand loyalty versus program loyalty. And and just so I don't get in trouble here with any company, let's just say it's Acme Company, Roadrunner, and just it's a phenomenal brand, right? The, the, it's known as a brand, but but there's also a brand of the affiliate program. There's how you run your program, and that's a big part of the decision of a lot of partners where they like your product, but your program's known, you know, to be a jerk and 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 to be a bad communicator and to be unfair and and I've heard a lot of publishers talking about how they make those decisions both on the brand and then, and then the brand of the, of the program itself. Um, you know, as we have this webinar, it is very public moves that Amazon's making and cutting some commissions and changing stuff and notifications that are, you know, causing a lot of uh, issues for people. And I, and I, and I do think they're going to remember them uh, after we, after we come out of this, this time period. So really encourage you to think about your, your program loyalty. And we thought we'd go here into um, some, some do's and don'ts. So, so don't, first of all, don't be curt. Um, you know, there, I, we understand the speed, the need to communicate, to make these decisions, they're top down. But I gotta tell you the big difference an hour can make. My team and I have a collection of, of notes we've been sent from publishers, from other programs, you know, one line notes saying we're shutting down today by two o'clock, um, take down your links and stuff that are just, relationship destroying. 
you know, the, people understand there are there are tough decisions that have to be made, right? But let's think about having a layoff as a, at a company, right? You could sit down the person, you can thank them with their service, you can talk to them, and you could say, get out the door and, and, and send them a one line email, you know, how you do that has a has a long impact. So, you know, people really need to this is going to be over at some point, And, and I think think long term, uh, and short term. And, and also, I've seen both sides of the spectrum here on on people being exploitive and people being tone deaf, uh, deaf, both in the affiliate channel and otherwise. So you definitely don't want to have a COVID-19 sale uh, on one side of the spectrum. And the other side of the spectrum, you don't want to use communication and stuff that just sort of fails to acknowledge uh, what's going on in the world, because I think both of those are, are, are resonating pretty poorly with, with customers. I'd, I'd also just want to chime in here. I mean, yeah, everybody's stressed out right now. Right. And, and you, you know, you, if you're the affiliate channel manager, you're probably worried about your job, your companies, you know, everything, your, everything on your side, your partners are in the same boat. So, you know, the more you dump, you know, this kind of uh, curt, short-term, exploitive, tone-deaf, it creates more anxiety and stress for your partners as well. So we all got to kind of work together here to, to, to stay friends and, and move on uh, for, the, for the long term. Yeah, look, and one of the things you guys I need to put on some boxing gloves and 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 talk to your your finance team who starts talking about budget and taking away the budget and going going, you know, getting away from you. Um, need to explain that this is a CPA model. Need to explain that if the company loves 7 cents on a dollar, then it should love 7 cents on on each dollar at $10 and it should love 7 cents on each dollar at a million dollars. So, we always really push for this education in general, but it's really important now to not get your budget cut when they're actually positive incremental sales coming into the company because of that traditional budget type thinking. So dues, do shift your budget from in-store uh, to, to online. There's a lot of opportunities here to capture, you know, sales that were really originally targeted to foot traffic. Um, if you know you had certain popular stores, you might even you know shift dollars to partners that you know that have geotargeting capabilities and can target people near those stores or around those stores. Some stores are doing pickup. Um, pickup may you know while it's big in the restaurants, it may become more prevalent uh, as part of the opening the economy plan. So really building that into your um, performance plan um, and yeah, incentivizing those cashback and discounts to capture capture the sales that that you want. We talked about this earlier, but critical, like focus on product categories that are in demand. Um, not a COVID-19 sale, but get the hot inventory to the front of your site. Use messaging that associates with it. Hey, keep the house clean or otherwise. I mean, people know why you're doing with it. Um, see if you can capture that in store traffic. And you know, if, if you're out of something, you can you know, start a wait list, make the advanced purchase, but merchandise that it's not going to be delivered for 90 days, but first purchase is first uh, one that gets it. I mean, I have friends waiting weeks for gloves, right? It didn't stop them from buying it. Um, so it continues to have you get the revenue and then you might even not have to pay it until it ships based on how your, how your program is, is designed. And, and we've had some very unique combinations, clients that I would not think would be associated with a product because that product was kind of, there was a run on that product at another store and, and they weren't known for it, but they were able to really focus it and elevate it in, in, in their marketing and in the communication to their publishers and, and move some inventory. So this is another one that, that we've been doing for years, but also is getting a lot of interest now. So we're, we're making sure that the CFOs and the CMOs of the companies we work with understand how powerful the, the, this strategy can be with liquidation. There, there are a lot of brands sitting on a ton of inventory from all their stores out there and winter stuff that was cut off and, and, and they're desperate for cash, right? And, and, in, and broken inventory is just dead cash. You can go to some of these deal-oriented um, sites, uh, the one that features something a day and share it with millions of customers and put it on their blog and in social and, and find a specific product and maybe discount it 50% and give them another 10% uh, off or something exclusive to them. And, and what it does is a couple of things. You're not trying to make money, but if it liquidated that inventory at cost or at a loss, uh, you'd have a CFO saying, oh, I need that cash from that broken inventory so I can actually bring my commissions back maybe to the other areas. 
But the other thing it does is people may not have bought that product from that company before. So if you can liquidate inventory, get a thousand new to file customers, you know, that can be a great win-win strategy. So we've been talking to a lot of our clients or CMOs and their CFOs about and, and, and how they can use this as a, as a strategy to liquidate. As mentioned before, you know, build customer loyalty. Um, the, the, a lot, there's a lot of interest in this model. You know, give people a reason to spend. Um, we see people doubling down on their loyalty uh, programs, extended return policies, you know, buy and book this now and you can get your money back if it doesn't work out. Um, really kind of a longer term messaging. They've also been doing doubling down on the give back. You buy now, we give one of these and there's people that need a lot from food to shoes or, or otherwise. And, and then, you know, embrace your community. Um, I, I think messages around help, the word help uh, and, and, and themes have really worked for people. I saw a story of a company that sells candles that just wrote a note to its customers talking about letting them know if they could help during that time or anything. It didn't have a link. It didn't have anything about buying. And their sales on their e-commerce site went up 5X that day because they seemed like someone who generally wanted to help and, and to be there for their customers. I'd also say, uh, gift cards, right? A lot yeah. of these smaller businesses, you may not be able to buy from me now, but if you buy a gift card, it supports our business and we'll, we'll you know, be around to honor it. So do lean into partner relationships, clear and transparent communication. So when you have to close down a, pro a, a program or something, show empathy and respect. You know, say, you understand this people's livelihood. I am so sorry we have to do this. You know, there was, a, there was an example that went out of a company that sort of shut down, you know, briefly and people were all upset. And the reason they shut down was they fulfilled out of their warehouse and they shut down their warehouse. I mean, the retail stores, they did it proactively because they wanted to make sure their employees were safe. Well, that's a message that, that people can understand, right? You can't change the news, but you can change um, how you're uh, delivering it. Uh, you can express that it has an impact on the other person. You can thank them for working with them. You can explain them why. You can give them more than you know, 10 minutes to take down their links. Do not tell publishers what a great benefit is that you're gonna leave their links up and working and tracking on a 0% commission. That is not a benefit in their mind. That is stealing money from them. If you're setting your commission to zero, you should be communicating how they take down their links and not implying that you would love to take all the traffic and sales for them for zero dollars. We've seen example after example from that and it's just angering um, publishers. Again, communicate the why. What, why is this happening? Why does the company need to do it? What's the duration? You know, share details on the program uh, thing. Stay updated. Make it personal. This is the time to be human. This is not the time to hide behind the affiliate team. This is the high, time to say, this is Mary Smith, and, and I'm happy to talk to you if you have any issues. One of the things that our did, one of our programs had to, just because of the industry they're in, one of the affected ones, really had to slow down the program dramatically uh, over these couple of months. One of the things our team did is where they set up call with all the top publishers, checking in on them, seeing how they were doing. There was nothing to do, but the feedback and the appreciative of that, that over acknowledging the relationship uh, was really important. I'd say too, I mean, yeah. taking the time to go with a few phone calls too. Hey, we're gonna be sending this email out. I wanted to talk to you. And, and you know, some of these partners may have some ideas of some things that they can do to help, you know, the way that they can, you know, ease some of the, better placements if you don't reduce commissions over a, a you know, placement buy, you know, a conversation can go a long way, open up some more doors. Yeah, how, how many of you that are program managers would love if you found out that you were furloughed or laid off with a one line email, right? That is how a lot of affiliates are finding out that their livelihood is changing with it with the program and it's just not the right strategy for long-term success. So do lean into partner relationships, uh, explore new, improve existing relationships, go against the grain. Uh, I, I would tell you to consider increasing commissions. You know, one of the things I've heard from publishers is that, is that with the discounting commissions, there's an assumption that that's gonna be a slippery slope down to zero. So people are, are, are doubling down on the ones that have kept commissions the same, or we've actually even seen some increasing commission. Um, I was talking to the CEO of, of BrandCycle yesterday, which is a, a super affiliate that works with several hundred um, bloggers. Um, and she shared that programs that had not cut or, or had increased their commissions on their platform were seeing 100 to 200% growth. There was a clear um, moving around by, by publishers of, to the programs that seemed to be leaning in uh, versus those that were looking scared. There is a fear that when someone goes from four to two, that they're about to go from two to zero and, and so people are moving uh, uh, away from that and they're making their decisions um, uh, appropriately. 
you know, hey Bob, look, this, this gets back to putting on those boxing gloves because a lot of yeah. people are getting told <laughs> by their CFO and executive team, you know, cut and you gotta, you gotta fight. You gotta say, let's think about this. Let's just have a conversation as opposed let's to try it for two days, away. right? Let's try it for a day. Let's see if we get the incremental sales that we want. Exactly. Um, see if fixed fees are still fixed. So if you were told it was a massive slotting fee or an integration fee or something like that a couple of months ago, the chances are it's not right now for the next 60 or 90 days. So we've had a lot of luck following up on some of the partnerships that we really wanted to get into uh, for brands uh, months ago that have suddenly become more accessible. Again, a brand that's hurting but has a large customer list or can't do anything right now is someone who could become a publisher or become really a brand to brand partnership where they're using their awareness. If you're a travel site right now and you're not selling travel, you know, there's stuff that you could sell or push to that demographic that's, that's similar. And, and revisit a performance model with influencers. You know, this is, this is a good time, again, to exert your leverage and, and potentially get more people on a performance basis who are asking you for, for fixed fees. And, and at a high level, really, it's just focusing on delivering value. So do whatever it takes to provide value to your partners. Again, sometimes that value is a phone call uh, if you don't have the dollars that you can give them. This is a great time to test new offers and new models. People are willing, people are flexible, they're adaptable, uh, you know, it, it, it more agreeable than we've seen them in, in a long time. Uh, respond to the needs uh, of the community. You know, focus on your different communities and constituencies and how you can help them and, and try reaching out to brands that you've never worked with. Again, there's an openness uh, that we've seen um, to do stuff that, that, that's new um, that, that hasn't been there in a while. Todd, did you have any additional thoughts there? Yeah, again, I think um, being flexible and willing to test anything right now is, is better than, than, you know, staring like a, a deer in the headlight kind of thing, right? You gotta, you gotta start testing. You gotta, you gotta do what it takes, right? Everybody's panicking and uh, you gotta kind of slow down and, uh, and kind of think about business as usual. Cause I think there are some great opportunities right now. So some of you have seen the U or the V curve, you know, this tends to be the stages of a recession or a crisis. You know, one, number one, I think for a lot of us, that probably felt like two or three years ago, uh, two or three, it did feel like two or three years ago, but it was two or three weeks ago when it just felt like a falling knife, right? This is the every day, someone asking you to cut, do something different. You know, it feels like maybe we're somewhere around, you know, a number two now where there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there, there's a fair amount of, uh, you know, we are thinking for a lot of our clients and partners, you know, what, what, what's the reopen plan for a lot of programs that, that, have been, that have been impacted, similarly to the economy. I can tell you there's a lot of data on this, some Bain and McKinsey or whatever, that the most money is made uh, you know, in the recovery for people who have a plan for three. You know, by four, it's a little too late. But, but this is, again, where you should be communicating, you know, hey, we may be looking at an opening date of X. Our commission is going to be Y. Here's what you can plan on. Here's what you can bank on. Please get us back into your rotation. In the same way that you gave them 10 minutes notice to close down, if you give them 10 minutes notice to open, uh, you're, 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 you're not going to earn a lot of friends and you're not going to be able to see the finger that they're giving you uh, on, on the other side. So these are partners. Bring them into your planning. Uh, you know, organizationally and, and programmatically, we're thinking a lot about three now and getting ahead of that curve. Um, because by the time it's four, you're already too late, the momentum's there, and you will have you have really lost the chance on the on the rebound. And, I, and I can go to the next slide. Another way to think about this is uh, if you also manage search or any of the other channels, I mean, keywords don't have feelings. You can you can stop buying your top performing keyword and Google and the keyword really don't care. Um, and even though we're making business decisions and we're being given, um, you know, direction by our managers, um, you know, this is still a relationship based uh, channel uh, where these are partnerships and it's not a one way street. So, you know, as Bob said, a, a phone call can be very meaningful. Um, even before sending, even just to the top 20, 30 partners, just taking that time to just try to call them. Uh, and again, something might come of that that wouldn't have if you just sent the email and moved on to the, to the next thing you're doing. So again, it's, it's key to kind of look at this from both sides. 
All right, great. So we're going to uh, open up the Q&A. I think we have some in there already. And I will, uh, I will move, open that up to facilitate. Um, it's on the boxes on the bottom. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to put in, please uh, put in the question. We will try to answer them. Uh, all right, uh, Tal, I'll give you the first shot on this, but what, what type of partners are good fit for liquidating inventory? Yeah, I think some people get deal sites and coupon sites kind of mixed up or they don't know the difference, but there are a lot of deal sites and they're really good at specific product or inventory, limited number, special price, going, going, gone kind of deal. So I would definitely look to the deal sites. Um, I think coupon and loyalty as well. But those are the ones that will drive that that the best. Don't you, you agree? Yeah, um, deal sites tend to more right focus on that product uh, and merchandise it. If you do work with a coupon site, they would need to do something, right? They would need to do a push notification or an email or something to really feature that product uh, versus the store. Right. Um, all right, I'll take the next one. Uh, what's the best way to offer value to your partners as a retailer if budgets are tight? So, so actually, this is an issue that I didn't bring up before, and the question it did did on it. So, one of the, the Todd talked about payments. So, in addition to lowering commissions, people are really deferring their payments to their partners, and, and they're not, you know, bifurcating between the public company partner that might be okay with that or the person that makes uh, a living on it uh, in terms of in terms of size. You know, I I think expediency of payment when people are nervous is also another way to add value. Like when the day you said you were going to pay, pay, because if not, but right now the, the bias is to now worry um, that, that you're not going to pay. And I, I have heard some people say that they actually like expedient payments are as important to them as, as the percentage um, right now, because they have the same cash flow problems as, as you. So if you wanted to, you know, go to the finance team or do something innovative, you know, maybe, maybe cut the commission, but double the speed of, of, of payment. And maybe, you know, kind of like people offer, you know, early payment discount, you'll have publishers that'll, that'll jump on that and your, and your finance team will be happy. Yeah, I would say move, keeping your payment the same is at least the, <laughs> yeah, the minimum, right? Yeah. Don't, don't push it out because frankly, a lot of the payments that are happening now are pre, pre-pandemic and, uh, you know, those partners are waiting for those funds and had expected them. So you're impacting their cash flow as well. So anything you can do there with your finance team would be a win for sure. Yeah. And, and, and if you lower commissions and miss your payment and delay it, um, people are very concerned you're going bankrupt. Um, well, and, a and, missed payment, <laughs> yeah. even with the commission rate staying the same, yeah. is a red flag, right? Like, yeah. I'm never going to get paid is the first thing someone thinks. Exactly. Um, all right, I think there are a couple that are going into the chat, not the QA. Hold on one sec. Oh, here we go. Um, all right, I'll give you this one, Todd. We're seeing lower customer spend in LTV given the, given the current situation. Users are spending less money because they're likely in a difficult situation. Therefore, management is pushing us to cut budgets, reduce CPAs since LTVs are declining. How would you approach pushing back on that? Concerned that cutting partner budgets is going to decrease our volume and hurt their business, which in turn hurts ours. That's a really great question. I mean, lifetime value, I don't know how you could be measuring that right now or even anticipating right. <laughs> it going down. I think right now, whether it's a new customer or returning or re-engaged, whatever you call them, dollars in is the focus right now. The most cost-effective dollars in, low risk, get them in um, is, is really the focus of what I would think most brands are looking to do, right? I mean. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know how, right. This gets into the definition of definition. So when someone says our LTV, you know, is low, I don't know how they're determining that over a three, calling an LTV over a three week period, right? I, what they're probably saying is the average order is down, which makes them fear that. But I, I if you're acquiring a customer and they're spending with you now, you have a shot uh, on, on them later. So I, that would make more sense to me if I heard that the average order value was down. Uh, maybe that customer defines, you know, long term as the first or second um, um, purchase, but yeah, you're going to have to look at that and you're going to have to make a little bit of a, a faith guess where the same time rates are down. So if you're acquiring that customer for a lot less than a couple of weeks ago, there's a good chance that you're going to get some of the tail end of that because you have their purchase, you have some information about them and you have their, you have their email. 
Todd, do you foresee publishers offering typical paid program support as a bonus for partners offering commission increases at this time? What's the best way to work with publishers for this? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, like I said, there's so many pieces that can be moved here, you know, getting almost back to the previous question. I mean, like it was management saying, this is what we want done and not having any discussion, there needs to be a strategy first, right? I mean, what what are we gonna do if we do nothing? <laughs> That's not a strategy, mm -hmm. right? So I think there needs to be a good, like ideas on the table that people can move around and say, these are the ideas we all like and we're willing to package up and do. That's what concerns me is that it's just a CFO saying, costs have to go to zero or as close to zero as possible and we want to manage cash flow it's just trickles down to a disaster so you know that, that's my biggest concern is that we're just not putting together a good long-term plan here that can give right. you and I, as back I said, up my, the curve my Freudian slip before three weeks and three years right it just it does feel like it's been years and I think we do need to all remember it's weeks <laughs> when we look at our models and we look at our plans you know, when you think about how we want to come out of that on the other side. Yeah, I mean, what's what? I mean, if a CFO or a CEO is to go, look, what is our plan to survive? Where what's our cash flow? I mean, have those real conversations. How much money? What's our runway right now? What money do we need to get in? And where do you expect us to bring it in? I I can, but here's what I here's the tools I need to bring it in. Yeah. Right. I love this question, ready? <laughs> for, for an affiliate manager who has a bull-minded CEO and the ability to increase spend towards the program, what would you, where would you suggest investing? Fixed placements, commission increases? How can the situation be best to use to track new publishers? Well, I'll just say, I'll let Todd answer, but I wouldn't invest in fixed if you don't, if, if you don't need to <laughs> uh, right now. Again, a lot of fixed stuff is, is, is available at a pretty big discount, but, or it could be an opportunity to buy run of site for, 75% less than it was a few weeks ago. Yeah, I think looking, talking to the partners that are your largest ones and say, you know, what can you do to drive more volume for me? I've got the ability to do something for you, not much, but I wanna figure out something. I'm not calling up to reduce commissions and push payment terms. My CEO is behind this channel, right? So I think that would, would be the approach I would take is kind of, because different partners are going to have different ideas and, and inventory opportunities. Yeah, figure out what the, we always say like, what are the business goals? And then you align the, the channel goals. Similarly, um, this one was, how would you suggest utilizing content publishers during this time to get your brand and product out while being sensitive to the current situation? Um, I, you know, there's an emerging thing of content plus deal, um, which is someone talking about something and then that, you know, review or they like it, but also that it's a deal or it's on sale. There's all kinds of stylish masks coming out. Like I think people have been really smart with how they're, you know, talking about the product. So if it's something that people need, then it's obviously something that content sites are going to talk about. But um, I actually think one of the underused strategies is working with content sites who talk about the product, but also highlight a deal. If, if you are, putting a site-wide 10% off coupon across the site and blasting it to people when you get there, you might as well tell your content partners about that so they can help use that and bring that in conversion to the site. You're still going to pay that 10% <laughs> off if you blasted it across your entire site. Yeah. And I think, you know, as you mentioned earlier with the changes with the Amazon program, I would imagine, I mean, they have a lot of partners that promote them exclusively and they could be rubbed the wrong way and looking for more opportunities. So it's hard to find them, but if you have similar products, you sell similar products that Amazon does, even some segments, um, you know, trying to promote your, that your programs out there and that you're not dropping commission rates. I, that, that's kind of tough. You have to identify, the Amazon partners. Yeah. I'm not trying, yeah. But I mean, hopefully they'll come looking for you because they're not happy. Yeah. It's a huge opportunity for everyone. And again, if you're if you were cutting commissions and and you know you have a chance to be above Amazon right now uh, and, and and take that business, that's that that's a real discussion that you might want to have with higher ups above you. So this is an interesting question. Playing devil's advocate, do you not see this as an opportunity for brands to reset on discounting tactics? 
One of the biggest mistakes brands made post 98 was aggressive discounting, which ends up being a race to the bottom where your price is your only unique selling point. What I've seen uh, in this pandemic from better brands is a shift toward being more customer centric. Strengthening dimension has more long-term gains than persistent discounting. So totally agree. I, I think this is sort of bifurcated answer. I think there's people that are focused on, on value and the total price. And then there are people sitting on mounds of inventory that's going to destroy their business <laughs> if they can't uh, turn it into cash. So um, we know consumers are going to be price conscious, and I think I think you need smart strategies there. I mean, if you have a service that people want to use, if you've got video conferencing, if you've got you know premium fashionable masks and stuff, I mean, there, yeah, there's no reason to be to be discounting those, and you're probably running on shortages if it's a service, but there is a real inventory problem that a bunch of retailers are, are gonna need to try to address. And if you want people to stock up on their winter stuff for next year, that's sitting in your factory and then will sit there for nine months, you are gonna to have to make a compelling reason for them to buy that now. Yeah, and I mean, obviously if you have products that are going out the door and you can't keep them in stock, of course you're not gonna discount those. But um, I mean, look, customers are not, looking to pay full price for things unless they have to. I mean, there are people willingly Toilet price paper. gouging yeah. <laughs> and being price gouged. They're happy to be price gouged because they just want to feel that they have that product. Um, but I think that's really the outliers. And so there is a bit of a balance here. I mean, I can see, you know, over discounting and then you become, you no. Know, everybody expects a discount. But if you're saying we want to help you you know, the whole idea that, you know, we're giving back to the communities where we operate, when you buy from us, that can go a long way as that's why the discount is being apl applied or not applied. You know, your discount is 30%, but it's going to first responders or something. Yeah. You know, there's ways to package this up to make it look appealing. And then the consumer choice kind of weighs in. All right, so we'll take one more. Um, and I think this is an interesting one. Uh, what do you recommend for publishers to start thinking about in terms of strategy for travel specifically? It's so up in the air right now, it's tough to put pen to paper. Yeah, certainly travel is, is a tough one and everything you do is also gonna be dependent on when people are, are released back into to society. Um, my personal belief is that, that people are, have been pretty pent up for a while um, they're going to be looking for experiences. They're probably going to be looking for change of venues. Uh, maybe, maybe travel not as far. I don't think you're going to see people flying all around the world uh, out of the box, but you know, people are going to get creative around, you know, the remote cabin in the woods, you know, is probably much more attractive than, you know, some big, uh, clustered event. So I, I, I do think there'll be people, they won't be looking to spend as much. They won't be looking to go as far initially, but they are going to want out of their house and they're going to want some sort of experience, but it's probably going to have some element of social distancing in it. I think it's months away too, because, you know, they're trying to turn the economy back on and they're going to be watching for more infections. And if that starts to go up, they're going to back it off again. And I think travel has the biggest kind of impact on the spread of the, of the virus. So I don't know. I, but but we have seen really even, we have seen some travel people, I think, which is smart, offering things that are in the future, offering them as fully cancelable, right, and, and bookable. So if you, again, if you want to get that customer, if you want to get the registered user, they are desperate to go on that trip. If there's a change in the timeline or otherwise, you'll probably be in a better position to move that. You'll know their intent. You'll know what you wanted. So I do think the pre-selling now and giving people the guarantee, uh, you know, Hyundai Hyundai actually made their whole car business in 2008 with that Hyundai Assurance program where they were, you know, not, you know, probably a tenth of the volume they were today. And they came out and said, if you lose your job, you don't have to make your payments. And suddenly, like, Hyundai sales grew uh, 100% year over year. And I saw they just brought that back. That's a similar kind of an adaptation is how do you, how do you lower people's risk, get them associated with your brand? get the word out there. Imagine if you offered some cool thing that was totally cancelable, removable, or also like just really like consumer friendly, and then other people might share or talk about that or write an article about that. So uh, it's going to be tough because that one's really, but as, as Todd said, externally dependent, but I think there are opportunities if you, if you think about how to create value. 
All right, well, there are a few more questions, um, but we wanna respect your time. Um, so thank you to everyone. You'll, you, we will make this available um, on demand. If there are parts you need to show to your boss, uh, you, can, you can pull those out uh, and do that and advocate for the channel. But uh, thanks for joining us today. It's good to be talking about how we can use this channel to, to solve problems and, and keep people working and, and keep the momentum uh, going in the, in the economy. So uh, thank you for joining us and, and you'll get a link to the download as soon as it's ready. Take care, everyone.